hope in God uh, for a new year. Uh, uh, we're beginning a series today as we begin our 21 days of prayer that I'm um, calling Ready, Set, Pray. Ready, set, pray. You know when, you, uh, when someone's doing a race, they say, ready, set, go? Well, the beginning of this year, we are saying, ready, set, pray. And we're going to be talking about prayer in the month of, of January. And uh, specifically, uh, yeah, to, to really inspire and call us to prayer. Because um, prayer is like uh, what a furnace and a heating system does to a cold building right? Prayer is what engages, the, by which we engage the Holy, with the Holy Spirit to see the fire, the passion, the purpose of God released, that we're joining in with God and what He's doing. And so whether you're here today or joining us online, I, we're going to be talking about this in the next coming Sundays, and I really do believe it's going to help you and help us as a church as we learn what it means to be a house of prayer for people of all, all nations, that we would, in a way, go to the next level, if you will, of our prayer life. Because sometimes we plateau, sometimes we get stuck, sometimes we get, you know, we, we, we kind of lose touch with what it means to really be in the Spirit and be in prayer, engaging with the Lord. And there's so many different examples and, and ways of praying and how we pray and why we pray. So we're going to get into some of that. And this morning, uh, we're going to be talking, I'd like to talk today about rediscovering or discovering the joy of prayer. The joy of prayer. If someone were to ask you, as I am now, if you were to describe your experience of prayer, what would you say? Would you say that it's enjoyable? Sometimes. I, I, I remember, sometimes I really don't feel like praying. But after I pray, I realize how important and how enjoyable it became. And so sometimes we've got to get over the hurdle of the flesh that we wrestle against uh, doing, whether it's getting up earlier in the morning, coming to a prayer meeting, coming to church, gathering on a Sunday. There's this thing that we sometimes fight, but as we get over it and press through it, we, it leads to a, a real enjoyment, um, especially in, you know, in prayer meetings. Um, I don't think there's been a prayer meeting that I've been to where I've left not feeling uplifted, not feeling energized, not feeling hopeful, because I've gathered with other people who are doing the same thing and want the same thing in God's will. And so there is a real joy in prayer, but we don't always see it that way. We don't always engage in that way. And that's what we're going to talk about today, because most of us, me included, if we're honest, we will say that, you know, prayer is, is, can actually be quite hard. It's quite hard to stay focused. Uh, we can get distracted. Uh, and so that is a skill and a discipline to learn, attentiveness before the Lord and, and to pray in these things. Uh, most, if we will say prayer, uh, the experience of prayer, we might say it is short. <laughs> I run out of things to pray. I don't get these people who like they say they pray for an hour like, I start praying and it lasts me like three minutes. I don't know what else to say. And so there's a sense of what, what does it really mean to pray? Uh, and, and how long should it be? And how should, of course, it can be short, it can be long. It depends on the nature and purpose of our prayers. And we, we sometimes think, well, prayer is just, it's mysterious or it's vague. I... I I don't know exactly what's happening because sometimes I pray and there's an answer uh, or the, the, it's the answer that I expected and sometimes the answer is not what I expected. And so what's really happening and, and it, is, uh, is prayer really making a difference, especially when you're enduring and you're persevering in a particular issue or praying for a long time, we wonder, is it making a difference? I want to ask us this morning, 
around discovering the joy of prayer. And we're going to get into some scripture passages today that talk about it. Do we see prayer uh, not merely as a practice or a discipline to do, but as the means to have a relationship with the living God? Right? Prayer is relationship with our Maker. Prayer is the means by which we engage the Maker of the universe, our Father in Heaven, our Lord and Savior Jesus, through the power of the Spirit, by which we have this relationship that transforms us and empowers us to join with Him in seeing His work and will fulfilled on earth as it is in heaven. Prayer is, and, but it, prayer is not just getting, you know, checking a, a checklist off of our prayer requests or uh, our, a Bible reading plan or something like that to say that we've done it, but prayer is actually engaging in the faith in relationship with God. It's the means, it's the language by which we relate to God. And there's many different expressions of those prayers. There's uh, uh, praise and worship is part of prayer. Listening, stilling ourselves before God is a form of prayer. Um, uh, interceding for needs is prayer. Praying in the Spirit is prayer. There's different means and ways of prayer and kinds of prayers that serve different purposes. And, but do we see the joy in that? Do we, or, do, or are we so fixed with a certain way of praying that we get bored or we get, it becomes lifeless or it, it, we become apathetic that we forget about that prayer is at its core the means by which we enjoy our relationship with God. Many times, probably like you, I have come to struggle with the experience of prayer. Sometimes my prayers are just lifeless. Uh, sometimes I'm praying the same thing. We get used to praying the same thing the same way over and over again, and we start to lose the meaning or the sincerity in what we're praying. Um, and it, sometimes our prayers seem aimless. We don't know if we're hitting the target. Um, sometimes our prayers are more lamenting a season of lamenting and less praising. And we're like, oh, like, that's not very joyful. I'm grieving right now. And there's a means of praying into lamenting by which we're grieving with God over something. And then, but at the same time, we realize there's other ways of praying that can help us enjoy the presence of God even in that time. Sometimes our prayers tend to take on more of a personal introspection and less intercession for needs around us. And so, it's an important aspect to think about. My hope today, and through this 21 days of prayer, is that our prayer lives will become more natural to us, effective, talk a little bit more about that next week, and enjoyable. And so let's just begin with James chapter 5, verse 13 to 18. As we begin, we're going to focus on a few texts this morning because of the topic we're at, looking at, rather than a, just a, a expositing one text today. James chapter 5, verse 13 to 18. Uh, if you have your Bibles, if you're taking notes, you can follow along uh, as well. James chapter 5, verse 13 to 18. Is any one among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them pray sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is, say that with me, Powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being, even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. 
Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. So James, the writer of this letter, James, to the believers, to the Jewish believers of the time in the first century, he closes off this letter of short mini-sermons, if you will, by call, uh, reminding people that, hey, we should pray about anything. If there's a difficulty, pray. If you're happy, praise. If you're, you know, if you're sick, you know, get someone to pray for you. Get the elders to pray for you. Get, if you're, uh, if you're uh, needing to confess sins, then you should confess those sins so that your conscience can be clear and your prayers would not be hindered. You would be healed. The prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. Then he says that, hey, take a look at the person Elijah. Well, everyone reading this is, well, Elijah, he's the godly man of God prophet. But James says, actually, he was a human being, just like you and me. And he prayed just like we pray. And, and, and we see the result. And so he's boiling down the essentials. Whatever the issue, pray. And that we can pray and that we can expect God to bring about the kind of result that we're asking for. Now, of course, we know there are qualifiers we pray according to the will of God. We pray with a clean heart. We pray, you know, there's different things that help us in guiding our prayers. But essentially, we pray. We're to pray about anything and everything. And uh, this is an interesting quote uh, by an author, Chris Hodges, about prayer. He says, prayer is to be our first response, not our last resort. Prayer is to be our first response, not our our last resort. That it should be the, the first thing we get to whenever there's a situation or in advance of something, prep preparing for something, we are to pray in and through and about and in, by means we're including the Lord and we're asking the Lord and we're depending on the Lord for His grace in those areas. Uh, I remember the, I lost my car keys once have you ever lost your car keys or your house keys? And I began to look everywhere for it. Could it be here? Could it be there? It might be there. Um, I looked everywhere I could look, and then finally, I'm just kind of touching my pants, and I, the car keys were in my pocket. The first place I should look is where they were. Prayer is to be the first response. Uh, in a situation. And now, now that's a, it's a very noble call, but it's hard to do, right? It's not always natural. When, when for example, when, we're, when Dryden was talking about prayer and 21 days of prayer, uh, some of you are like, all right, I'm excited. Finally, finally there's a call to prayer. You know? Um, others, and you're like, I'm in. Others are like, oh, I don't know. Uh, I could, I'll, I'll follow the prayer guide. I can do that, but I'm not sure how much I can really come to corporate prayer. It's, it's awkward, or it's, it's, I'm not used to praying with someone, or, or there's different reservations we hold, or we tune out. Sometimes we think, oh, the call to prayer, well, that's for the, that's for the spiritual people. That's for the serious Christians. Are you trying to tell me you're not a serious Christian? About God? No, I'm just kidding, sort of. But anyways, the corporate prayer is important as well. Uh, sometimes we disqualify ourselves. I'm too busy. I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm not spiritual enough. We, we have all sorts of reasons. Uh, I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray in a way that I'm really... And, and so really, friends, this is what we want to talk about today addressing this, those reservations, hesitations, and per preconceptions we have, misconceptions about prayer. And that's mainly this, that prayer is, is to be and can be enjoyable. There is a joy in prayer that I think some of us maybe have not discovered or we need to rediscover again. And I, and I want to address one key issue, one way uh, highlighting how we, and how we can actually rediscover the joy, joy in prayer. 
uh, especially when we've been disappointed, especially when we, we're not sure uh, if prayers are helping or working or where we're at in the Lord uh, as we go about life. So we're gonna, to do that, we're going to look to now Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Are you with me so far? Okay. All right. Psalm 37, we're, we're going to read verse 1 to 7, and we're going to highlight one, one phrase in there, but I want to give us a, a context here. Do not fret because of those who are evil or envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Take delight in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him. And he will do this. He will make your righteous reward shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways when they carry out their wicked schemes. Now the psalm continues, but in verse, when we get to verse 23, we, in 24 it says this, The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Though he may stumble, he will not fall, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. What's the gist of what the psalmist is saying here? As opposed to fretting, comparing, why are the wicked prospering? Why is this happening? Um, he's inviting uh, the singers or the prayers into a different mode into a different orientation. Instead of comparing, fretting, getting upset about apparently evil people prospering, he's giving an alternate, alternative invitation to delight in the Lord, to commit our ways to Him, to trust in Him, to wait on Him. The Lord will deal with the outcome of evil. Yes, we must undress injustice and, and uh, work against evil in our world to the degree we can, but but we should not be fretting, worrying, or fearing because all of that takes incredible mental and emotional energy that we can instead say, okay, Lord, I'm coming to You. And the key to discovering, I believe, the joy of prayer is learning what it means to delight ourselves in the Lord. If we want to discover the joy of prayer, we are to restore our delight in the Lord Himself. And as we're delighting in Him, there's the joy that flows, there's the trust, there's the peace, there's the guidance in our prayers, there's the relationship in our prayers with the Lord versus just reading prayers or saying prayers. If you notice in this passage, many of these actions, trust, do good, dwell in the land, enjoy safe pasture, take delight, commit your way, be still. Uh, majority of those are, 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 we do that through prayer. We, we express that in prayer. We express trust through prayer. We express committing our way to God in prayer. We delight ourselves in the Lord. Why? By, how? By, by being before Him. Meditating on who He is. Meditating on His Word. Delighting in Him. And so I want to talk about this one word, delight, today. And, and how to restore that delight in the Lord. What, what do we see from Scripture? To delight in something or someone really means, it means to, to find satisfaction and fulfillment in it. To take pleasure in. To experience enjoyment. When you when you are enjoying the presence of another person with you, a conversation you're having, or an activity you're doing with them, what are you doing? You are delighting in them. Is that right? Uh, and, and when you, when, uh, you are uh, enjoying a particular meal, you are finding satisfaction. You are delighting yourself in that meal and you're experiencing joy enjoyment with. So then, to take that and say, delight yourselves in the Lord. 
How do we do that? So we can rediscover the joy of prayer by restoring our delight in God. How do we restore our delight in God? We're going to look at three aspects today. Uh, one is first invitation, the invitation to delight. Secondly, the motivation to delight in the Lord. And thirdly, consecration of delighting in the Lord. So firstly, invitation, and that's this. As we've already read, God has invited us into relationship characterized by delight. God has invited us into a relationship that is characterized by delight. It's, it's, I don't know if you, if you can think about that with me for a moment. To delight in the Lord, the maker of the universe, the God who has created all things, to delight in the one who sees you, knows you, is Lord over all. Um, the one we are to, yes, fear with holy reverence. We're also invited to delight in Him. To enjoy Him. In His presence, as Psalm 16 says, is fullness of joy. There is delight and there is joy in the Lord. And, and uh, not only that, but when we delight, as we heed the invitation to delight in the Lord, Scripture tells us what we can actually expect. What will actually happen when we delight in the Lord. Uh, for example, what we just read, delight yourselves in the Lord and He will give you desires of your heart. He will give you the desires of your heart. As you're, you're, you're one with Him in delight, you care about the things He cares about and He cares about the things you care about. He gives you the desires of your heart. That will, He knows what you need, what you desire, uh, and as you delight yourselves in Him, there is, uh, there is an effect there is a result that happens that takes place in our lives in a way that wouldn't happen if we didn't delight ourselves in the Lord. It's amazing to think about. Not only that, if a man, if a person, if a woman delights in, a, in his way, it says, in verse 20, uh, 23, the Lord makes firm the steps of them. them. The one who delights in Him. So when we delight ourselves in the Lord, we are established in our steps. We, he leads us in a firm way. Uh, though we might stumble, though we might make mistakes, we're not going to fall headlong. We're not going to be you know, disqualified. We're not going to be cast out. But He upholds us with His hand. And so the call is to uh, delight. Delight ourselves in the Lord. The invitation is to delight. For many of us today, how do you see God? Do you see the Lord as one you can delight in? Or are there some doubts? Are there some barriers? Are there some experiences of disappointment? Are there some walls that have been built up that, that keep you from the perception of God as our Father in heaven who loves us, as Jesus who walks with us, as a friend of sinners, making us saints, as the Holy Spirit who is our counselor, our paraclete, our one who walks alongside us, our comforter. How do we see God? And to the degree we see Him, will it impact how and whether we will actually delight ourselves in the Lord? And in delighting in the Lord, um, it's about enjoying. It's an invitation into enjoy personal relationship with the Lord. Psalm 1 says that the one who delights in the law of the Lord, right? You're going to be like a tree planted by, by water, streams of water. That whatever they, they do will prosper. There's this... There's a result of delighting in the Lord and in the law of the Lord. There's positive outcomes. Stability, flourishing, and fulfillment. This is what happens when we delight and heed the invitation to delight. Now, we're going to address some of that. Why, why, why might we not 
um, delight in the Lord. The motivation aspect. Let's talk about motivation. I believe that this is so key, and I think this comes up in teachings a lot. Uh, even you know, if you've been a Christian for many years or a few years, you probably will know, understand this. It will make sense, but I think it's, it's, it's something that really needs to hit our hearts, is uh, mo- the motivational aspect of delight. We will not be motivated toward delight in God without believing His delight in us. We will not be motivated towards delight in God without believing His delight in us. This is, I think, where sometimes we get hung up. Because relationships are built on trust. Relationships uh, uh, with God is built on trust in His unfailing love. Trusting in His character, in His nature, who He is. And sometimes we have a difficult time connecting delight with prayer or conversation with the Lord um, because at the back of our minds we think, well, I'm not, I'm not good enough for this. God is upset with me, therefore. Right? And so we, we have a difficulty drawing near to the very One who is delighting in us and inviting us to draw near to Him. Um, and so do we know, do we know this d- deeply in our hearts that the Lord is, delights in His people? That the Lord delights in you? You know that? Do you believe that? Tell someone next to you, you know, the Lord delights in you today. It's so important to know. Um, Zephaniah 3.17 uses this language, um, speaking to the people of Israel, um, God's plan to restore them because of His love, because of His covenant faithfulness. He says this, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In His love, He will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. Isn't that crazy? Not crazy, it's awesome, right? It's, it's, uh, it's amazing. Um, the Lord rejoices over us with, with singing. Um, that's a picture of joy. The joy of God over us. His people. Now, we may not, you know, act accordingly. We may, of course, we're not we, 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 we slip up, we sin, we make mistakes, but that doesn't, that, the, the fact that we trust in the Lord and come back to Him and, and walk with Him shows us that we are in this relationship um, that the Lord loves us and He delights in us. Despite the, uh, the Jewish people and the story of Israel, the covenant people of God, despite their history, despite their rebellion, God still loves them and He will take delight in them. And in the same way, those of us here today, all those who believe in and follow Jesus, the Messiah, the King, the Anointed One of God, they're grafted in to the people of God and He delights in us too. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it does not know Him. This is something we got to, I don't know, just keep being reminded of. Even in our prayer as we begin to pray, as we begin to be still, can we, can we, can we realize through Scripture where we begin to even sense the delight of God over us, the love of God upon us. Most of us in Christian circles and over the years, we hopefully understand this, but for many of us sometimes we, are, we find it difficult. There is a difference between grace-based motivation, love-based motivation, versus guilt-based motivation. Right? Shame-based 
motivation. There's different things that can motivate us to do different things, right? And in the same way, I could stand up here and say um, to all of us, um, you guys, you're lousy. You don't pray enough. Shame on you, right? Like that's... And, and I could say the same thing to myself. Would it be true? Maybe. But does it motivate us? No. It will just shrink us back. It will cause it. Because the way. Okay. And we are all guilty of this, I think. It, we, we. And it's. If you are in any place of responsibility, uh, whether you're a parent, whether you're an employer or a supervisor or you, 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 your, one of your responsibilities is to motivate or to train or to guide, we you have to be careful of this, right? Because you can shame people into the outcome that you desire, but you've lost, you've lost their true motivation or you've lost their, 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 their heart, their core. Like that's not done out of a sense of joy. Even, even when you do difficult things, even when you're called to make sacrifices or, or, or step up in certain ways, it's got to come from like, yes, this is what I'm born for. This is what I'm meant to do. That God will give me strength to do it versus like, in order to measure up, I have to comply. Right? With God. Right? So, so this is where we, we, we struggle with this guilt-based motivation and grace-based motivation um, and friends, we, we need to be in that place of grace-based motivation where we, he, we, we know that the Lord delights in us and yet at the same time, because of His delight, He will prod us, He will provoke us, He will discipline those He loves, He will urge us on, but out of, a, out of great delight and, and, and love and uh, believing more for us that we would walk with Him. And so, what motivates you to draw closer to the Lord? What motivates you to delight in the Lord? Are you motivated by curiosity or wonder of who He is? Where you look at Scripture and you're like, man, God, you're a mystery. I want to know more of who you are. And so you're motivated by, by curiosity and understanding who God is from Scripture and the ways of God, how He works, and what happens when He's this, but He's also this, and it doesn't seem that contradictory or, or not, right? So uh, the very reality of God should motivate us to curiosity and wonder versus drawing back, thinking that He's distant, thinking that He's uninvolved, that He's uninterested in you. No, because He delights in you, man, that that can provoke us to curiosity and wonder of who we are. Who, Psalm 8, for example, um, is, is like this. Um, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is Your name in all the earth. You set Your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, You've established a stronghold against their enemies to silence the flo foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is mankind that you're mindful of them? Human beings, that you care for them? In fact, you've made them a little lower than the angels. You've crowned them with glory and honor. You've made them rulers over the works of your hands. You've put everything underneath their feet. Wonder, curiosity. Lord, when I think about this, like, how come you're even mindful of me? Right? So this, this motivation by curiosity, wonder. Are you motivated by vision and calling? That God has more for you. And you believe that. And so you're motivated to step into that. Because of His delight, because of His love, He, is, he, is, he has a dream for you. He has a destiny for your life. And we're called higher and further into that. And we hear the call of Jesus, follow me and I will 
make you this. I will make you that. I will, uh, I've got more for you. Are you motivated by that heavenward call? And of course, as we're talking, motivated by his love for us, his delight in us, that, that begins to show up in how we pray, doesn't it? We, we are more sincere, more authentic, more um, grateful for his love. And that, that um, and you know, that's, that is actually really important. That's an important thing about prayer, is especially how Jesus, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, <clears throat> first says, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, Right? And that's not, okay, you don't have to like stop right there or move on, keep moving on. No, no, Father in heaven, like, like consider that. Hallowed be your name. Consider that. What are the names of God? And, and, and it's like, it's not, the prayer isn't like, um, Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. Lead us not into temptation. You know, we forgive those who sin against us. Oh, and hallowed be your name. Let your kingdom come. No, that shapes our whole perspective in prayer. The one we're coming to, who he is, his kingdom come, that, that purpose, and then recognizing, oh man, like he'll give us our daily needs. <laughs> You know, and so so we're motivated by his awesomeness and his delight in us, um, and his trustworthiness that he can be trusted with what we bring to him, that he's good. And so when we're motivated by his love and his character, and this all happens as we delight in him, right? Um, we're motivated then to press through, to have patience, to know there's a blessing, there's a reward through this time of trial on the other side of this pain, that God is in fact for us, not against us. There, there is, so, so to discover the joy of prayer, we, we must heed the invitation to delight in God, and we must also know the motivation that delight brings by spending time with Him in these ways. And, and Recalling his goodness, recalling his faithfulness. We're not, you know, we're, we're, it's, it's, it just shapes our perspective. Okay. Um, number three. Uh, are, you, are you ready for number three? Okay. Because this one will take another two hours, but no, just kidding. Number three is the consecration of delight. We learn to delight in the Lord through acts of consecration. Delighting in the Lord looks like something, right? Um, there are actions connected to delighting. Um, If you're delighting in someone you are, you are engaging with and you are attentive to them, you're listening to them, and, and then you're, you're talking with them, and then it, it, it's, it's an ebb and flow to delight. But we delight in the Lord through acts of consecration. Consecration is another word for being, being set apart or setting something apart for a purpose, for uh, a use. And consecrating, the scriptural language says is, well, we are to consecrate ourselves to the Lord, set ourselves apart to the Lord for a purpose because He has set us apart. He has consecrated us. And in the same way, we consecrate certain things to the Lord for a purpose. And so in delighting in the Lord, we do that through acts of consecration. We're going to look at an example of this this morning. And we're going to look at an example from Scripture where delight is expressed in an act of consecration. Uh, David, King David, he's getting older. He's turning over his crown, his kingship to his son Solomon. Uh, and David really wanted, David really wanted to build a temple for the Lord. 
They were, had the tabernacle and all that, but he wanted to, to build a temple. It was his desire. It was his affection. It was his delight to see. He delighted in the house of God. Um, but the Lord said, no, it's not meant to be you. It's going to be the next, the, you know, your son is going to do this uh, for, for different reasons. But, but this is what is read, and I, I want us to, we're going to look at this. Uh, 1 Chronicles 29, verse 1 to 6. And it says this, Then King David said to the whole assembly, My son Solomon, the one whom God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. The task is great, but because this palatial structure is not for man, but for the Lord. With all my resources, I have provided for the temple of my God. Gold for the gold work, silver for the silver, bronze for the bronze, iron for the iron, and wood for the wood, as well as onyx for the settings, turquoise, stones of various colors, and all kinds of fine stone and marble, all of these in large quantities. Now, verse 3, besides, in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God over and above everything I've provided for this holy temple. 3,000 talents of gold, of, of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver. Man, that's like, that's rolling in the, in the wealth. Uh, for the overlaying of the walls of the buildings, for the gold work and for the silver work, and for all the work to be done by the craftsmen. Now, who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? So... So David is like using himself as an example. Um, and David, he's, what is he saying? He's saying, listen, Solomon's going to build a temple, but I've pretty much got everything ready. <laughs> I've got all the resources that provided through Israel, through the, 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 the land, and through the gold that's been acquired. And not only that, because of my devotion, and in some translations, because of my delight in the house of God, I am going to give over and above a lot of my personal resources to see that this thing gets done. And I'm not even going to probably be able to see it. But because of my delight in the Lord, I'm going to do this. And then he, then he's like, now who's with me? Who's going to do the same thing? Who's going to consecrate themselves to the Lord today and to this task? David. David. is about our affection and our delight for accessing the presence of God, the temple, with the people of God. We're all in this to intercede for the purposes of God. And, and so what, what we delight in, and as we delight in the Lord, it tells us a lot about our values, our priorities, and who we are. And to grow in delighting in the Lord, we engage in acts of consecration that will enrich or prior to prioritize the Lord in our life. And so, I'm coming to a close here. What does this mean? Um, it means that to delight in the Lord, you have to decide, how am I going to do that? How am I going to show that? What different act am I going to do what change am I going to make to 
show the Lord, and dem- but, not, but not just show the Lord, but actually um, uh, make it even possible for me to do it. And so we engage in acts of consecration. Um, just like David engaged in an act of concentration, consecration through, through giving, through giving out of his life and his resource and his personal treasures, that was an act of consecration. Um, uh, he was doing that and he was inviting the people of God to do the same. It is an act that marks a shift. It resets things. It, it brings about a new orientation to the Lord and to His ways. And so what are some examples of acts of consecration? Well, here we see um, the priority of giving to the purposes of God out of material resources. That's one way of consecrating ourselves. And I think if you have the practice of giving and tithing, you're, you're doing that, right? Right? And sometimes the Lord kind of taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, give a bit more, you know? Are you, do you trust me? Or, you know, give in this way or give in that way. Uh, are you, you know, everything we have belongs to God, right? So that's one act of consecration. That's, that's not what we're talking about today, though. We're talking about the consecration of, of delighting in the Lord through prayer and fasting. When we fast, for example, fasting is like prayer with an exclamation mark, right? It shows that we actually want more of God, and we're giving of ourselves, we're denying ourselves to pursue God more in that regard, or seeking God on an issue, and so prayer works with fasting. We... we, we're not going to get too much into this about fasting, but except to that in this invitation of prayer, we're also inviting you to consider to fast. And in the prayer guide, there's a bit of a basic guide at the back. You can think, well, Pastor, I've never fasted. You know, I don't, what's the purpose of fasting? You can look at that guide. It helps a little bit. Um, there are different kinds of fast. The, the basic fast is denying yourself food, right? For a time so as to pray, to seek God, to trust God, to, to, instead of feasting on food, you're feasting on Him, on His presence, on His Word. You're, you're, you're going that extra mile in a sense. There's a degree of intentionality you do with fasting. So you may have never fasted before, but you have gone without food, right? You know what it's like being hungry for maybe a day? Well, that's fasting. The difference is you're, in the, you're, instead of not eating, you're doing that intentionally so that you can intentionally seek God um, and, and, and take more time in His presence. So it might be a day that you're fasting. It might be uh, several days that you're fasting. Now, if you're not used to fasting, you probably won't be willing or able to do that. You, you start small, right? Some people, the scripture talks about different kinds of fasting, different lengths of time. Uh, Some fasting you can, you know, of course, with for health reasons, it may not be advisable to fast, depending on where you're at in your health or different conditions or situations. But we might just be a juice fast. Um, It might just be like Daniel. He he uh, ate fruits and vegetables. Not meats and sweets for a season, right? So you, you're fasting part of your diet away to focus on prayer or, or, or on the Lord. So there's different examples of fasting. Um, man, bare minimum, friends. Fast the things that are starving your soul or the things that you're feeding on that are distracting you from the Lord. So fast your social media, fast your favorite TV show, fast the things that are taking up time that, yeah, may have some positive benefit, you know, relaxation, leisure, entertainment, fine, that those are all good, I'm not saying those things are bad, but, but there is a time and a season to think about 
how you handle those things, to reset your spiritual life through prayer and fasting. Give up something, you know. Uh, make some kind of sacrifice as to the Lord. Consecrate yourself to the Lord. So, all that being said, to delight in the Lord, if you want to discover the joy of prayer, uh, uh, learn the joy of delighting in God through, through saying, I, I, I feel led to do this, I'm going to do this. Uh, you, you do things, you make sacrifices for the people you love, right? Um, so, so uh, because you delight in them, because you love them. In the same way, the Lord is, it's not like that God needs it from us, but he's inviting us into a new dimension of prayer, of delight in him. But to get there, like, you only have so much room in your stomach, right? So do you fill your stomach with junk food or good healthy food, right? You know what I mean? So you have to decide how much needs to go so I can replenish and refuel and re be nourished by the Lord in a different way. And so you, you have to make a decision on that as well. And some of us maybe are in a, a sense of plateau or you, you've been disappointed in the Lord or you feel like you haven't done enough. You're, you're in this kind of guilt-based motivation. Friends, hear the invitation to delight in Him again. Hear the the pure motivation of delight, not out of guilt, but out of the, the delight of the Lord. He has so much for you. He's called us higher to greater things. And, and then thirdly, consecrate yourselves through delighting in Him, through, through certain things. And so at the beginning of this year, I'm going uh, to invite the team to come at this time, and, and we're just going to respond. They have a song that invites us to respond today. Um, as we begin this new year, that we would um, re-engage in a new way through prayer, through delighting in the Lord. Um, I'll close with this one story. Uh, about eight months ago, about eight months ago, I started to play uh, soccer. I like the game of soccer. I started to play. I, uh, I found people to play with, um, and it's been after many years of not playing soccer. And man, I thought I was in shape. <laughs> I thought I was in shape. Um, I run a bit. I, you know, I did all the stretching, uh, that kind of thing. Um, and so I played a soccer a few times. But then there was one particular day that we were scheduled to play, and it was pouring rain. Like it was fun, but it was like it was pouring rain, and we're playing soccer. And and I don't know if you've ever played sports in rain, but man, it gets messy. It gets hard. You're more likely to slip. You're more likely to damage some body part, you know. Um, it increases the risk. Stopping and turning. And, and so after that day, and you don't feel it right away, but man, the next day and the day after that, like my knee was just done. It was so sore. Uh, and And... Every time I would then, so I stopped playing soccer. <laughs> uh, my knee would not allow me to play soccer. I started to run a little bit, and I could only run a, to the point, to the threshold of my pain in my knee. And so this kept me from that. And because of that, I couldn't have the joy of playing soccer. I couldn't have the joy of even running and being active in that sense. Um, I needed to recover. How do I recover that joy? Um, how can I get to that place again if it's possible? Well, um, the way that I had to do that was I had to consecrate myself to some strengthening and conditioning. Of my knee, I had I went to get a, a, fit, a trainer, explain what was up, and they gave me exercises to do. And man, those exercises were were not easy. You know, you had to hold your leg up with weights and 
as long as you can and they build up that muscle and, and all of that stuff. But that's what I needed to do to recover a better use of my knee, right? Uh, and you guys know, you know, there's two different examples of, of hurt your back out or whatever and, or, or your arm gets strained or, or something that happens in your body. And, and there takes like physiotherapy, right? Or ongoing things and, and all sorts of stuff. Friends, um, I, I just want to share this because uh, sometimes we, yes, even we the, in the body of Christ, can have a sore knee or a bad back and we but in that we need to consecrate ourselves we say Lord you know these pains you know these impediments in my walk with you you know these desires I have and to come back to the place you know you're worrying you're fretting how come this person's so way ahead of me? How come this is happening? Like, how come these evil people are doing, you know, they seem like their life has got together. My life is in shambles. And the call back today here from the Word is, um, don't fret, but delight in me. Come to delight yourselves in the Lord. I know your desires. I will help you. So I invite you to stand this morning. Um, if you want to, um, if you want to grow in delight in the Lord today, if you want to rediscover the joy of prayer, of your walk with God, um, well, so appropriately we have a song this morning. Come to the altar, and uh, typically we say the front is the altar, right? Um, but really we mean the altar is we're coming to the Lord. He laid his life on the altar. He was the sacrifice for us. He uh, enabled us to, to join with him in his purposes. And so if you, uh, if you want the Lord to touch you, if you want to consecrate yourself to the Lord in prayer and in delighting in the Lord, as we sing, I'm just going to invite you to come to the front. And we're just going to corporately pray and consecrate, give ourselves to the Lord this year, into the season of fasting, into the different issues that the Lord knows all about in your life. And we're going to say, Lord, I hear your call to delight. I'm motivated by your love to delight. But now I'm consecrating myself to you, to delight. In you. Can we do that, friends? Can we do that as individuals? Can we do that as a church? I want to just open up the front. Let's worship and then let's pray and close in prayer together. Thank you, Lord.